Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you're having a great Wednesday afternoon. I'd like to thank you for joining us. Today's webinar is Network Video Worth It? 10 Common Myths Debunked. Today's webinar is sponsored by Access Communications. In today's session, we will learn hard network video facts with visual support and tips to maximize sales around network video solutions. I'm Andrea Morgan, ESA's Marcom Specialist, and I will facilitate today's webinar. Before we get started, let's cover a few housekeeping notes. First, all callers will be muted for the duration of this webinar. At any time, please feel free to ask a question by clicking into that section of your control panel. We will ensure we reserve some time at the end of the webinar for a question and answer session with our speaker. A recording of this webinar will be made available in the resource library on esaweb.org at the end of the day. And finally, today's webinar will include a live polling feature and results will be shared live. Without further ado, I'm very excited to introduce to you today, Andrew Barker. Andrew is the Senior Project Manager for Educational Services at Access Communications. He heads the core content development team that creates classroom and online training, as well as collaborates with third-party educational organizations to build strong partnerships in the technology community. Andrew has been with Access since 2011, and he's recognized as an Access Certified Professional physical security professional, and certified alarm technician. Along with these, he holds a number of other certifications in areas such as VMS platforms, networking, 3D drawing tools, and educational development platforms. Andrew, thank you for joining us today. I will now turn it over to you. Thank you very much. That was quite an introduction. Um, so as uh, was mentioned, we're gonna go over the um, common top 10 myths, and myths, excuse me, and uh, just show you why they don't really apply, uh, those myths don't apply to the uh, network technology, as a lot of people would assume they would. So uh, one of the biggest things we get asked all the time when we talk about going from analog to an IP solution is people just wanna know, is it worth it? And this used to be a very fair question, to be honest. I mean, it was with any new technology where, just to back up a little bit, uh, IP video surveillance cameras were introduced in 1996 when Axis actually created and invented the first one. And at that point, it was kind of a big question if it was really worth going to a, a digital platform or an analog because back in 1996, it was one of those new technology, but also networks weren't really like they are now. They were kind of limited. Well, all that's changed now. We all know that everything is going on the network, and with that, it's made it more powerful, but also more cost effective. And we're going to talk about a lot of those scenarios. And before I hop over to the next slide, we did have one quick poll just to see where everybody stands in their uh, career in the physical security industry, I'll say. So uh, if we could put that poll question up, I'm not sure if I need to do anything or. Okay, for today's live poll question. We would like to know what is your experience and knowledge level with IP network video solutions? Attendees, the poll should now be visible on your screen. Please go ahead and choose your response now. Okay, we will leave it open for a few more seconds. All right, the poll is now closed. And here are the results, Andrew. Should I be clicking? Oh, let me see. Maybe I have to click this to see it. Is there uh, somewhere specifically I'm supposed to be seeing them or? It should be on the screen. We have 27% saying that they are a newbie. 23% saying that they are a pro, and 50% are at the 50-50 mark. Okay, that works, and uh, that works very well. So thank you for sharing and putting that poll up for us. So that's just a good gauge, too. We wanted to see, first of all, share with you all where everybody stands, but also it helps us kind of get a gauge for the audience and where everybody stands and their experience level. So let's talk about myth number one. The first myth, analog and IP technology aren't that different. 
Now, I'll be honest and say that this one I don't hear as much as I used to. I used to hear it all the time. People said, oh, it's just as good. And the example I used to always like to give would say it's like comparing your old, well, I guess not only everybody's age, but depending on how old you are, your old analog wood frame TV to a modern 4K digital TV. There's just no comparison. We all can relate to that. So let's first talk about cabling. Well, we all know with analog, it was coax. And when I say this, there can be that mindset. People think, oh, well, coax is only good for analog then. And that is not the case. You can reuse coax, and I'll talk about that later. But with your analog cameras, it was coax for data, and you had to have another cable for power. So that was two cables going to your analog camera. Where with your digital solution, it was one twisted pair of cable, and that's doing your data and your power. So right there, that's a big difference. One less cable to run, that lowers the amount of time it takes to install these cameras. Scalability also. Analog solutions typically came in about four to 16 cameras at a time. They came more as packages like that, where IP video solutions, you could easily grow them one camera at a time. What we mean by that is with your analog system, it was harder to just add a camera, because you have to, again, do your coax, uh, a power cable, depending on your solution, be it a DVR, or whatever it's going back to, maybe going far back, even further, going back to a multiplexer or something. They didn't always have just one more spot you could add a camera. Where with a digital solution, it's much easier to just simply grow your solution, especially since most modern buildings already have a, a network infrastructure. There's already Ethernet, maybe a fiber backbone. That it's already in place in the building. Remote access is another big difference. Analog cameras by themselves, there is no such thing as remote access. Uh, there are ways you could do it, but you have to go through other devices, go through your DVR, get on the network. There, there's a lot of steps to get remote access to an analog camera. Where utilizing a network camera, an IP-based camera, is if there's access outside of that network, then you can set up to securely log in remotely. Now, security is a big issue. I'll touch on this again later. It, if I can say... When it comes to security with any devices, you are kind of blunt saying this, but you get what you pay for. So the higher end products tend to be much more secure on your network. The really inexpensive, really cheap things, typically they're not doing a lot to secure their network. So for example, for access products, they have a lot of built-in features to help you keep these devices secure. Also, as you talk about security, this is why it's so important to do firmware updates. A lot of people hesitate to do that, a great real-world example, though, you all do updates for your Windows machines. A Windows update is often keeping your devices more secure, it's protecting the new risks that are out there. Same thing with firmware updates. Analytics are a huge one. An analog camera, I always like to describe it as just an eye. It has no brain. Where a digital camera, an IP camera, it's a brain with an eye. So you can actually have built-in intelligence in the device itself. You can actually have analytics that live in the camera. Why this is important is one, it gives more features to your solution, but also it frees up space on your server and on your network. Because now, well, one, your server doesn't have to run these analytics, the camera's taking over that processing power. And then the other part is, you could set it up so your camera doesn't even send video unless something's going on, and that can preserve your network. Where with an analog solution, no intelligence is happening at the camera at all. It's just sending video. That's all it can do. But there are hundreds, thousands of built-in, or some are built-in, but they can be added in to an, a digital camera. We call them applications. It's just like applications for your phone. The example I always like to give is uh, for your phone, you probably, your smartphone, you downloaded Angry Birds. Well, instead of Angry Birds on your camera, it's going to be a people counting analytic, a license plate analytic, a tailgate detection analytic. There's thousands of them out there. Same idea. It is truly an application, but since these essentially are computers with eyes, you're able to add, remove, really modify your camera to meet your solution. And that's something that just isn't possible at all with an analog camera. 
Also, there's a wide variety of options. This is just a handful of them. And right here, these are all folks here on recording platforms. You can record to an SD card right in the camera. You can record to a NAS. Uh, recorders, uh, these can be larger servers, depending on your enterprise level, if that's the case. Or we have other ones are called appliances. These are kind of like NAS level devices, uh, really built for video surveillance. So. so myth number two, the hype behind IP video hasn't been proven. If you've been in the industry or in the technology field at all for a while, you already should know this myth has been debunked. Everything is going on the network, and that's how you can prove that its value is there. So cameras have been on it for a while. For the past few years, access control has been going over to network devices, and it's actually funny with the access control, a lot of the conversation I've heard with it is the same conversations I used to hear when IP video came out, where you had these people who are just in their whole careers in analog IP video saying, no, IP is never going to take uh, there's not much of it out there yet. Don't worry about it. And then IP now dominates the industry. Uh, the same conversation is happening with the access control community now in some some areas. And it's almost comical how it's, it's identical to the conversation we had in the video world when it went from analog to digital. Uh, speakers are going to a digital platform now. And I'll show you a better example of that later. Another great one, great example, nothing, access has nothing to do with this, but it is happening in the industry or in industries. Lights are actually going digital now. So it's already happening, but probably 10 years down the road, most lights you see in office buildings, maybe in houses, are going to be network devices. They're going to have IP addresses. And the reason all these things are going that way is one, it lets you utilize power over Ethernet, makes it easier to inst install, but also it's making all these devices intelligent so they can communicate with each other to make things more efficient. So as I talked about IP access control, well, the brain now, everything is in that device, this control panel that's actually out by the door. How it typically has been, you'd have your readers, Nexus, whatever out at the door, those all had to run back to a central control panel. And that's where any intelligence, if there was any, took place. Well, now, this device here is called A1001, it's actually out at the door. It's PoE powered as well, so power over Ethernet. And then, within reason, the readers, the Rexes, things of that nature will be connected to this and also power using that one Ethernet cable. I say within reason because if you're in the access control industry, everybody's first response is, all right, what if it's some big maglock? Well, yeah, it's probably not going to power that, but your common things like your readers, uh, common locks, things of that nature at will. But again, this is going to be the brain, and you're going to wire all those components right to it. And again, you can see the Ethernet cable right there. That's providing the data and the power. And this, like all IP devices, is an intelligent device. So you can program this right here in the interface. So you don't have to worry about um, any other configurations back at a central unit. It's all happening right here out of this panel. Let's talk audio. This is what the typical or traditional audio solution looks like. You got amplifiers, uh, all kinds of other devices. Well, as we go to an IP solution, again, just showing that IP, this network-based solution is really what's taking place. Now, built into that device, that one uh, speaker at the end is the amplifier. It's also the equalizer, and it's also uh, any kind of um, network connection, it's all there, it's just one cable. So that way, it's less wiring, less equipment, much easier to manage. And it's PoE again, and that's an intelligent device. So that device can communicate, that speaker can now talk to other devices on the network. Myth number three, IP surveillance only meets the needs of enterprise level applications. There definitely used to be some merit to this, but not really anymore. It's become much more common for all, all levels of solutions. So it could be your house, grocery store, could be a pharmacy around the corner. It really covers a wide variety now. And a lot of that has come down to the fact that networks 
have become better across the board, making it more cost effective for everybody to have good networks. But also with that, as all technology improves, the cost has gone down. So the equipment isn't nearly as expensive as it used to be. Now, that's across the board. So you see examples like here's one in a restaurant called the Beer Cellar. Well, not a restaurant. It's just a little uh, uh, beer store. That's a very small solution. They're able to use Access Camera Companion, and that solution provided them the cameras, the storage, the switch. And because it's all IP-based, they can easily use, it, use the app that comes with it to view it on their phones, iPads, from their house, wherever they are. Police departments, they use it all the time, IP-based solutions. And police departments are, are a good example for most police departments of smaller scale solutions because they're often not gigantic buildings. I mean, of course. But it's a great way, because it's all network-based, to integrate the access control, the cameras, the speakers. It's all tied together into one solution. And all these devices can talk to each other to make it more secure, but operate more efficiently as well. Myth number four, network video image quality is comparable to analog. So actually, I'm going to, before I go ahead, this is one that really used to just make us chuckle a little bit when people would still swear that analog cameras were better than IP video, uh, video quality. IP video, I mean, except for maybe the first IP camera that ever came out, IP video has always been better. And there's a, a couple of caveats to this. And when we talk about this now, a lot of people say, but wait, there have been improvements in analog cameras. And there absolutely have been. But they are nowhere near keeping up. There are analog cameras you can get now that are around one megapixel, maybe even a little higher. But the IP world has been there for so long. In the IP world, we're talking about 4K, 20 megapixel, way beyond what analog now is capable of. So while, yes, you could get a good, a good quality analog camera nowadays, it still is in touch to the extent that IP is gone. And when I say these, the, the quality that the network solution gives you, I'm not just talking about access. I'm talking about the industry as a whole. The resolution, the quality is just improved tremendously. But one way analog has never really been able to compete, and they have improved on this, of course, but this is actually a common thing you all probably saw in your old analog TV. There was an effect called interlaced, where what's actually happened here is for analog devices to work, they would give you, they couldn't give you the full image every single time. So they would give you odd lines and then even lines. Put that together and then that was your image. Well, the problem was, like you're seeing here, if something moves, which is always happening in security. So you get your odd lines, then oh, the object moved a little, and you give you your even lines, and the two lines of video miss a little. And you get this combing, and they'll call it a tearing effect sometimes too, where how it really looks in a fast moving image, it looks blurry. And that's not at all helpful for video surveillance. You want a crisp, clean image. That's why for your digital cameras, they're gonna do it a little bit differently because they now have a processing chip. It's all gonna be digital here. So instead of doing the interlace, they're gonna give you what's called a progressive image. That's the full image every single time. And that again goes back to the fact that they have a chip. They have, a, well, ours is called an RPEG chip, but they have a processor chip. They really have a brain. And this is what's able to allow these devices to do all kinds of advanced features, but also give you these really good quality images. And again, it's gonna be a digital image. So it's ones and zeros, it goes back to binary, because it's a network device. And with these image improvements come different technologies. A lot of these, we're just gonna show you a couple of them. One is called LightFind. This has been out for years, actually. You've probably heard about it. So this is actually a combination of improved lenses, improved image sensors, and the improved computer or, uh, chip inside the camera. So here's this scenario, nice and dark. If you saw it slowly, God, I'm actually gonna play that one again. You're gonna see it start to get brighter. That's actually Light Finder being turned on. Because Light Finder allows you to see color in extreme low light. When I say low light, I mean so dark that you and I can hardly see anything. It can give you a color image. Other technologies are like wide dynamic range. Now this, I will fully admit, 
wide dynamic range is nothing new. This is not something we created with IP cameras. It's actually existed since photography's existed. There's really old photographs. You can do it with a new wide dynamic range. But what's changed is because of the art tech or the processor chip, it can devote more resources to, to this technology, making it better. So what essentially happens is when you have a scene both dark and bright, the camera looks at it and says, okay, we're gonna take a bunch of images that are overexposing the dark areas. So that's what you see on the left. So it makes the left side brighter, but the windows get a little harder to see out of. And then at the same time, your camera is taking a bunch of images that are actually underexposing those bright areas. You can see how the inside is a little darker, or you can see out the windows. And then because again of this processor chip, your camera is able to take way more of these images than you'll ever see. And then it's able to stitch these back together to give you an image where you can see both in the bright and the dark, like you can see here. Myth number five. IP video solutions are too expensive. This absolutely used to be a real world concern. Not anymore. The cost of the equipment has gone down. It still is typically more expensive than analog, but the total solution cost has definitely changed. So let's look at that. Analog solution on the left, IP solution on the right. Your parts still are more expensive. Can't, can't argue with that. It's still gone down in price, but overall, they still are more expensive than analog. That's actually one of the only reasons analog stayed alive so long is because they just made their equipment so inexpensive. However, the labor is much more in-depth for analog solution because, again, it's coax and a power cable. It's also just much harder to troubleshoot because it's not on a network where a lot of the well, one, the installation is one cable for the IP solution, but also a lot of the troubleshooting then afterwards when you're trying to set it up can all be done remotely through the network. And that's also why the service part is much different. Servicing an IP solution is much easier than servicing an analog solution because a lot of it, you don't even have to go on site. You just do it remotely, which is why the total cost of ownership is much less expensive for an IP solution. Also, you're future-proofing it. If you go out and install new analog systems where you're actually installing coax, doing things of that nature, eventually that is gonna run out because that side of the industry is slowly going away. Where if you already have the customer start embracing the IP solution, there, regardless of who they're with, they're just setting up better for the future so they can grow with technology. Myth number six, if your customers already have an analog system, they're stuck with it. Well, we definitely know that's not true. For quite a long time now, there's existed encoders. Encoders act as the brain, but they do more than that. They also allow your solution to become network-based. So what you do is connect your analog camera to the encoder. Your encoder is now the brain. So all those features you can do in your standard IP camera, you can now do through your encoder. It just uses the analog camera as the eye. Now the encoder is on the network and it is PoE powered. So it's got one cable to it. Also, when we talked about that interlaced issue, encoders actually have a feature called de-interlacing. We're then able to remove that combing effect you're seeing. So there's a couple of images before de-interlacing and there's some after. Now, one thing to point out, it didn't improve the quality, it didn't improve the resolution. It can only give you as good as the analog camera gave it, but it was able to smooth out some of that tearing, that combing effect that was taking place to give you a better image though overall, kind of reduces that blur. And there's a wide variety of encoders too, depending on your solution. From one channel, all the way up to 84 channels, depending on what you need. So encoders, there's variety within them as well. Of course, they come with edge storage, so you can put an SD card in many of them. They're power over Ethernet, so there's your PoE power. IO ports, maybe you want it to also turn a light on, trigger a door. Maybe you want someone to hit a switch and have the camera do, or the encoder do something, whatever the case. And also you have serial ports. Serial ports for the encoders that support it, or how you would use an encoder with an analog PCB camera. So 
so you can control it that way. Myth number seven, transferring video data over a network will overload it. Again, this is a theory that a myth, it, it had some truth to it back in 1996 when it started because networks weren't that great. Nowadays, networks are strong, they should be, if, if you, especially if it's a new, newly built network. I mean, think about how many people stream Netflix all the time. You can do 4K in Netflix now. If networks can handle that, they can handle video surveillance cameras. Good networks can. But even to help that, there's been other improvements. So first there was motion uh, JPEG, that's what we've used all the time. Then to help with bandwidth and storage, MPEG-4 was used. Now we still use H.264. H.265 is now more heavily starting to be used, but Access also uses something called Zipstream. Now, to really understand Zipstream, you have to understand H.264 and H.265 a bit more. I'm not gonna go really in depth about it, but absolutely follow up if you wanna go really in depth into what it does, but I will give you kind of a, a taste of it. Because Zipstream is not a new video codec. These are all video codecs. But Zipstream will work with either H.265 or H.264. And it does everything at the camera side. So from your server standpoint, it doesn't know anything changed. All it knows is it just has a smaller file size. So typical compression, we look at that whole scene and it would compress everything equally because it doesn't know, hey, the yellow areas we don't care about, the green's what we do. It would just look at the scene and say, all right, you want to do a compression of uh, 40? All right, we're compressing everything. That doesn't really help. So one of the benefits of Zipstream, it's able to be more intelligent with its compression. It looks at this scene with every frame, every P, what's called a P frame, it's determining what's called a region of interest. Essentially, it's what's moving. It acknowledges those areas. You wouldn't see it like that. That's how the camera sees it in its mind. It says, all right, the areas that aren't moving, we clearly don't care about, I can compress those harder. The areas I do care about, the regions of interest, I'll compress those less. And by doing that, it saves bandwidth but preserves quality over the areas you care about. Myth number eight, IP video surveillance is not secure. We used to hear this one a lot, and actually we still hear it a lot, because cybersecurity is a huge thing. And with analog solutions, I mean, there is no encryption, there's no authentication because it's a dumb device. I'm not saying that in any way, just there's no intelligence in it. It is what it is. Well, once you put on a network, there becomes this fear, oh, it's on the network now. It's gonna, it's gonna be able to hack into everything. That's not true. A network, if you're truly securing your network, it, it's as secure as it will ever be. Putting one of our cameras on your network will not make your network more vulnerable. Now, there are issues though in the industry of equipment that does make your network more vulnerable. And that goes back to where I say is, you kind of get what you pay for. I mean, if you go for the cheaper solution, they're probably not doing much to secure your, your network. And I'm not just saying that for Access, I'm saying that for lots of the reputable brands like Access, we do a lot to help make sure our equipment is always secure. Also, this fear of somebody getting into your network, it really only applies if you allow remote connection to your network. So often they just won't let, there's no router, there's no outside connection. And that definitely makes your network more secure, but there's all kinds of ways you can do it. The one big thing about cybersecurity and protecting your network, it is not a one set, hit a button and you're done. It's a constant process. So it is recommended that you definitely have knowledgeable IT people on staff who are constantly keeping the system up to date for all security threats that are out there. There's some private firewalls, strong passwords, private networks, the typical stuff. Myth number nine, IP surveillance is not reliable. So it's actually incredibly reliable nowadays. Um, the cameras, for the most part, are pretty reliable. Usually if there's ever issues, it's other equipment. I'm not just saying that because I work for a camera manufacturer, but it's usually the network, power, a switch, a route, something else usually taking place. Because I will say within, when you get on network devices, there are more variables you might have to consider, but it's because it's a more powerful solution. 
but everything's become much more reliable. So one common way to keep it up and running is just with backup power to UPS. So when the network loses power, the UPS keeps it alive for a determined amount of time. Also, there's features like failover recording. So there's your recording. Somebody's gonna unplug your server. So the camera will now start recording automatically to an SD card. Power comes back to the server, it starts recording again, but that automatically pulls the recording, marks it a different color, but still puts it in a different time, puts it into the correct timeline to show you this is what took place when your server went down. There's also a lot of effort, a lot of uh, time that R&D puts into making sure there's a high quality and that standards are upheld within these IP solutions. So we care a lot about IK ratings, which are impact ratings. This is actually what the military uses a lot. This is nothing we made up. Uh, some of the common ones are IK8, 10, and 10 plus. Your IK10 is the most common you'll see for vandal resistant. IK10 plus are for serious applications. Uh, just to give you an example, that camera right there you're seeing on the right hand side is actually designed specifically for prisons. So uh, it's got a, it can take some abuse to say the least. IP ratings. This has to do with when we say solid, it means things like dust and water. So there's a wide variety of these ratings. And again, this is nothing access made up, it's industry standards. Where IP66, for example, that means it's uh, dust tight and it's protected against strong jets of water. Oh, here's the, well, actually, I can show you the IP52 first. There's the IP52. And then for the IP66, there you go. There you go. Also, when we talk about reliability, quality, there's also an organization called Onbif. Many of you have probably heard about it, but essentially it's trying to provide, or it's putting standards to the whole industry, but it also allows us all to work together. And there's different profiles on Onbif, and it's a whole conversation in itself. But there's Onbif S profiles, which talk about cameras. There's on the G profiles, which are for like your VMSs, servers, things of that nature. And then there's on the C, which relates to access control. Myth number 10, IP video does not fit my business model. So it's really nowadays should fit everybody's business model because the cost has gone down but it also can fit small, medium, and enterprise level solutions. There's solutions to run the gamut. So for your small, there's a solution like Companion, just a handful of cameras, switch, recording, all in one package. When you get to larger, maybe medium size, like a school, now, because again, it's all network, you can incorporate your access control, your door controllers, your server switches, your audio, all into one solution again. So it really can run the gamut and meet every solution. And because things are all going on the network, it'll give all of you tons of potential to upsell because it's much easier to add something to a network solution than it is analog solution because they're all network devices. So once that network infrastructure is there, it's very easy to grow from that. Um, and again, with that, just more opportunities for returning revenue and just to generate more income. So I believe that was everything. So with that, I'm gonna hand it back and I believe we're gonna leave it open for some questions. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, thank you, Andrew, for your presentation. Callers, we hope you found this content to be informative. We will now open the session for question and answers. You can ask your question in the control panel box. Um, we have one question here. Analog, you don't have to rely on the customer's network. What happens if the network goes down? Will they not be able to see the camera? So that, that's a fair question. And it depends on the solution, of course. So there are definitely applications where it's a smaller solution and you are depending on the customer's network. And if their network goes down, then yeah, your system goes down too. Uh, often to try to get around that, people will put in a separate network just for your cameras, your security equipment. 
it's kind of the same idea as the analog system would be separate for everything else. Do the same thing, but just have it be your, your IP-based solution. That's a good question. Do these devices have push notifications to both the subscribers and the central station? So that would depend on the solution you went with and who was managing that, the central station side part. Um, by itself, it wouldn't necessarily do that, but depending on who's hosting this for you, you could definitely set up that solution, absolutely. Okay, if there are no more questions, I'd like to thank Andrew for his presentation and thank you to all of our attendees for sharing your valuable time with us this afternoon. As a reminder, a recording of this webinar will be available at esaweb.org in the resource library. Thank you all for participating. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye.